All right. So thank you so much um, for the invitation to come and speak, and uh, Natsu for the uh, work on the exhibition. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you all for coming. Um, so I guess I'll just get started. 26 years before the meeting of Isamu Noguchi and Chi Baoshu, a group of nine Ainu, the indigenous people of northern Japan, traveled from their villages in Hokkaido to St. Louis, Missouri for the 1904 World's Fair. The exhibition recruited indigenous peoples from regions as diverse as Alaska and the Philippines to live in native villages for months at a time. They were asked to construct homes from materials brought from their point of origin and expected to perform their ethnicity for the benefit of turn of the century fairgoers. The Ainu were of particular inter interest because of their ambiguous ethnic origins. They were romanticized by many as a rare example of a proto-Aryan, proto-white people surrounded by Asians in Hokkaido, Japan. They were often called the hairy Ainu and their hair, or as we'll find today, often the lack thereof, was used as a poignant contrast to people of Japanese descent. The intense cultural fascination with these people represents a unique moment in American and Japanese history where bodies and ideas traveled great distances between the US and Northern Japan. My presentation focuses on several vivid encounters leading up to the Ainu ethnological display. Today, I explore the surprising overlap and interplay between discourses of anthropology and science, ink painting and art collecting, and tales of the traveler, American, Japanese, and indigenous. The presence of indigenous peoples is often ignored in narratives of the East-West encounter, and this elision causes us to overlook a very curious and generative contact zone in the early 20th century. To use the words of Mary Louise Pratt, a contact zone is a social space where disparate cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other, often in highly asymmetrical relations of domination and subordination. Just as the encounter between Isamu Noguchi and Chibaishu represents one contact zone where artistic ideas were exchanged and grappled with, here I examine a different kind of modern encounter at the fringes of art history. Today, I pursue a triangulation where Japan is simultaneously central and peripheral to the meeting between American anthropologist Frederick Starr and the Ainu, focusing on a young man named Betegoro. I want to begin by briefly laying out the parameters of Frederick Starr's mission and his initial counter encounters with the Ainu. Here, I acknowledge an equally important, though often unrecognized, part of Starr's journeys to Japan his fascination, and one might say obsession, with the Japanese artist geographer Matsuda Takeshiro and the curious way that ink painting and collecting figured into Starr's anthropological mission. Following this, I want to turn the tables to examine an encounter from an entirely different angle, that of the Ainu Betegoro and his indigenous wanderlust that defies the dominant image of the Ainu in turn of the cemetery presentation. Focusing on the Ainu display's chief organizer on the one hand and a fair participant on the other, the Japanese context is liminal and ever-present, embodied not only by the already deceased geographer Matsuura, but also by the presence of the Japanese national display at the St. Louis World's Fair. Problematic in terms of place, this project also complicates disciplinary specificity. To understand the emergence of this exhibition, we need to untangle a hairy encounter of people bodies, and visual representation. Frederick Starr was an anthropologist and University of Chicago professor, perhaps best known for his work on the Congo and South America. In 1903, he received a letter from W.J. McGee, the head organizer for the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, asking him to go on a mission to Japan to secure several Ainu for display. In a letter to a government official, McGee describes the scientific and educational imperative of the ethnological display. Quote, the general motive of the ethnologic exhibit is to, exi is to illustrate the marvelous industrial development of modern times by contrast with industries of various Aboriginal people. And my special motive in desiring to enlist an Ainu group is to illustrate the enormous advances of the Japanese people in recent times beyond the industrial standards of her Aboriginal tribes. There is an additional reason for desiring to exhibit Ainu people. 
in that they represent better than any other living Aborigines that industrial stage by which habitual movements are centripetal or inward, rather than centrifugal or outward, like those of modern Japanese and the more advanced Caucasian. McGee's flattery, tempered by his comparison to the more advanced Caucasian, gives us an idea about how the Ainu were expected to fit within the scheme of the 1904 World's Fair. The National Exhibition of Japan was located amongst other modern nations and displayed not only technical and industrial accomplishments, but also showcased the art of modern Japanese artists, to be touched on by Jason in his talk uh, following this one. However, below the large Philippine exhibit, the Ainu exhibit was set apart with other Aboriginal people, such as the Zoneka Indians, which organized people in terms of their comparative social evolution. Starr traveled to Japan with his Mexican assistant, Manuel Gonzalez, in order to procure some Ainu for this very purpose. Traveling from Hakurate, Starr searched for what he called the Greybeards, or Ainu that best fit American and European stereotype of the hairy Ainu wild man. Assimilation policies made it difficult for Starr. He wanted bearded Ainu men and tattooed women right when beards were being shaved off and tattooing discouraged by Meiji period officials. Starr's journey is presented in a fairly matter-of-fact manner in his personal travel journals. There are times when we can read between the lines to see another kind of agency emerging, an agency that I will discuss in relation to Pete Goro in just a few moments. But Starr's interest in the Ainu was, on the whole, located in the realm of professional obligation. While Frederick Starr's search for the Ainu needed for the living ethnological display, he also began a more personal search of a different variety for Ainu objects and curiosities, most notably Ainu kakemono or hanging scrolls. The object Star secured formed the basis of an impressive collection of Ainu artifacts maintained by him and his assistant. In searching for these objects, he encountered a range of personalities, the self-proclaimed Japanese Robinson Crusoe, Oyabe Jenichiro, the botanist Miyabe Kingo, and the British missionary to the Ainu, John Batchelor. Traveling far and wide in his search for objects, Starr often highlighted the trials and tribulations of securing specific items in his journal, and thorough accounting reveals the complexity of early collector networks in Japan. Although Starr was an anthropologist by trade, he also had an eye for art. In his writing, he constantly louds the geographer and explorer, Matsuda Takashiro, for his artistic prowess. Matsuda, the geographer who was instrumental in the naming of Hokkaido, was praised for his thorough and sensitive depictions of Ainu culture through the early Meiji period. Unfortunately for Starr, Matsuda passed away in 1888, 16 years before his arrival on Japanese shores. Although never encountering him in the flesh, Starr's passion for the geographer caused him to publish a short biography on his life, where he writes, that the Japanese are impersonal is a trite and commonplace observation. It is true to an extraordinary degree that they are non-individual, impersonal, and given to acting as a group. It is, however, also true, and not inconsistent with this quality of impersonality, that the Japanese are to an extraordinary degree free and untrammeled in their tastes. A striking example of this originality in a population marked by impersonality and non-individualism is found in Matsuda Takashiro. He was a man of great ability and power, remarkably original, and of an independence in which many individualistic communities would scarcely have been tolerated. Matsuda's hybrid identity as scientist-artist was appealing to Starr, who must have felt a certain kind of sympathy with the deceased geographer. Although Starr was not known to paint himself, he took pride in his collection of paintings and photographs, combining them in thematic exhibitions, such as one focusing on Mount Fuji in 1916. I'm struck in the way that Frederick Starr describes Matsuda's paintings versus his cartographic renderings of the northern coast, a visual comparison that we can also examine here. His paintings and the woodblock parents created from them are described as embodying a, quote, simplicity and force. In a description of a hanging scroll of Ainu gathering kelp in the possession of Miyabe Kingo, Starr describes the work as, quote, a very simple piece done with a few lines but exceedingly good. He expands this description in another publication by saying, it is a simple picture, a few lines, and delicate coloring, but it is living. 
Despite the death of Matsuura, Starr imbues his work with a sense of life in his textual description. Although I was unable to locate this particular hanging scroll, Starr took several photos of Matsuura's paintings that may have had a similar aesthetic, and a large amount of Matsuura's woodblock prints are still extant. In comparison to other artists of Ainu E, whose work Starr would have undoubtedly come into contact with through his intensive search, Matsuura's hanging scrolls capture vibrant mo motion in a looser style of ink on paper. Ainu beards are constructed through a series of looping strokes, and the bodies in the festival scene here convey the rhythm of dance not through context, but through repetition of form and heavily modulated line. Starr's analysis of Matsuura's work equates his, quote, living ink with the untrammeled taste of Japanese people. This essentialized reading of ink painting may have something in common with the dualistic thinking that divided Eastern ink from the Western nude, a topic that will be explored today by Bert Winther Tamaki um, later today in the context of Lawrence Binion and Isamu Noguchi in the next panel. Matsuda's Ainu stand in extreme contrast to his maps and illustrations of Hokkaido's flora and fauna, which are stark in their realism. In describing Matsuda's maps, Starr writes, we were impressed by the wonderful detail in the old map. The painstaking care and fidelity were notable and spoke eloquently for the accurate and honest effort of the old geographer. Matsuda's notebooks made in the field with careful accuracy were marvels of diligence. He observed everything, plants, animals, human beings, life, customs, products, soil, topography, altitude, drainage, and coastlines. Apart from the fluid bodies of Matsuura's Ainu figures, I argue that Starr values Matsuura's other productions not as a Japanese artist, but as scientist geographer who mastered Western empiricism. It is his painstaking accuracy that elicits praise, even though the heavily modulated line that compromised Ainu bodies can still be seen in his undulating rivers, crawling like veins through the Hokkaido countryside. Despite being scientific maps, these renderings of Hokkaido contain the breath of life, Star notes. Unable to read Japanese, Star's appreciation of Matsuda's works were primarily visual. I believe that in many ways, Star saw Matsuda as a kindred spirit, as a man of art and science, with a taste for exploration that also characterized Star's own public identity. As a frequent cultural cross-dresser, Star may have fancied himself as a hybrid of sorts. His desire to know and get close to Matsuura also manifested in an extremely literal way. With his assistant, Star traveled not only to see Matsuura's Nehanzu portrait painted by Kawanabe Kyosai in 1886, where Matsuura takes the place of Shakyamuni in his Pari Nirvana, laid to rest under the Hokkaido tree. But he also went to one of two sites where Matsuura's remains were laid to rest and photographed the monument to commemorate the occasion. Star's encounter with the work of Matsuura is important when considering the role of art in the practice of ethnographic collecting. After all, the trip to Hokkaido was a function of Star's professional responsibility. For Star, this meant gathering and cataloging textiles and implements of native peoples, in addition to amassing examples of their representation, produced not only by early Japanese explorers and anthropologists, but by artists, printmakers, and photographers a diverse body of images, all of which found home in his personal collection. In a sense, like the personality of Matsuura, for Star, the gap between art and science was not as far a field as we feel in present day. And the connoisseurship of ink on paper emerges curiously in the context of a scientific mission. At this point, I'd like to switch gears a little bit from Frederick Star and Matsuura Takeshiro to the Ainu that Star and his assistant procured for the display. For the Ainu that found themselves in St. Louis, there must have been a very different kind of encounter. It's worth quoting another portion of a letter from W.J. McGee that describes how the Ainu exhibit would fit into the exposition itself. It is the desire to install such a group of about eight or 10 persons on the grounds on which will be located about a score of groups of United States Indians together with others representing the Aborigines of Mexico, South America, Central Africa, and, I hope, other parts of the world. All these will be placed immediately adjacent to the Philippine exhibit, which is largely ethnologic, 
and it is planned to have all Aboriginal groups live in habitations erected by themselves from materials brought for the purpose, and to have them pursue their ordinary avocations in their accustomed ways. It is to be understood that this ethnologic exhibit is part of the exposition proper. Introduced wholly for scientific and educative purposes, in addition, they will be permitted to produce and sell in the grounds for their sole benefit any articles they may be in the habit of making. A female photojournalist named Jessie Tarbox Beals took the most notable photographs of the living ethnological displays. Her images were not only sold to fairgoers, but also found an enthusiastic audience in popular newsprint media in 1904. Although most of Tarbox Beale's images adopt a pseudo-ethnographic approach in depicting the customs and manners of the Ainu, several of her photographs also show interesting slippages where the fair itself is revealed. In this example, the Ainu named Hira Muda Shutratek weaves matting. But through the window, one can see the distinctive outline of American man pursuing the fairgrounds and the blurred faces of a man and woman with a flowery hat peering through the window. Images like this remind us of one possible contact zone where indigenous peoples like the Ainu mingled with American men and women. Global indigenous studies scholar Danica Madoc Saltzman warns of the tendency of World's Fair studies to, quote, relegate these people and their experiences, and thus the experiences of all indigenous peoples, to the realm of the unknowable, unimportant, and powerless, end quote. Heeding her warning, I want to examine the experience of a young Ainu man named Bete Goro that serves as an interesting contrast to the personal search of Frederick Starr. Goro, as he was often called, was one of the last additions to the Ainu group and allowed to come along despite not fitting the stereotype of Ainu masculinity that Starr was trying to exemplify. Starr describes the moment of Goro's addition in depth. We had learned immediately on our return to Sapporo that Bete Goro was anxious to go with us, but had hesitated about taking him. Goro is young, shaves, wears Europeanized, not to say Japanese, clothing. To be sure, he still wears Ainu leggings and fine embroidery. He is dreadfully conventional. Instead of whittling inao, he knits stockings. Now, all of this is highly commendable, but it is no qualification for figuring in an Ainu group at the exhibition. But Goro was lively and happy and anxious to go. That was something, and we believed his influence would do much to cheer the somewhat morose Yazo, the timid Shirake, and the group that were mourned as dead. So we decided he should go. We should, leave we should leave his wife behind in expectation of an event of importance to the Ainu community. Mr. Bachelor was asked to communicate the decision, and Goro was summoned to his study. A moment later, Mr. Bachelor called us to see, quote, what ails this crazy fellow? Goro, who had seated himself upon the floor, was beside himself with joy. He hugged himself, chuckled, laughed, swayed from side to side, literally rolled upon the floor. With his accession, our party was complete. Although Starr writes from a biased position, we can still feel a sense of excitement, the excitement of going abroad and seeing the world, of being a trailblazer. Looking at this photograph taken by Tarbox Beals of the entire Ainu group, I want to emphasize certain aspects that set Goro apart from the other Ainu at the fair. First, he was not part of the three family units that compromised the rest of the group, and he was the only Ainu to join the group as an individual. He was not the youngest at 26 years old. The couple Osawa Yazo and Hiramura Shirake, or Ume, was 23 and 19 respectively. But in comparison to Hiramura Kuturoge and Hiramura Sangyea, the two older men pictured here. Goro and Yazo both had the countenance of young men. As news media was quick to point out, Goro was often described as the only bachelor among the group, often omitting mention of his pregnant wife back in Hokkaido. However, not having family attachments afforded him a certain kind of freedom. Here, Goro, pictured at the very left, stands slightly apart from the rest of the group, his checkered button-down shirt peeking out from underneath his Ainu Atush robe. Although he finds himself in several of Tarbox Beale's photographs, most of them centered on those who perceive to be more authentic expressions of Ainu-ness. Perhaps we can see Bete Goro as having the very same kind of love of travel and exploration as Frederick Starr or even as Matsuda Takashiro. There was a very real sense of danger associated with the journey to America, and villages such as Piratori performed funeral ceremonies for the men and women before leaving, as noted and explored by Madoc Saltzman. Packed on a steamer bound for Yokohama, Bete Goro saw Honshu for the first time. 
sang songs for Japanese school children in Tokyo, endured a long trip to the United States fraught with seasickness, tried on new clothing and went on a trip to the zoo and to an American dog show. He saw African Americans for the first time and he remarked, are they always that color? Um, and he also engaged with other indigenous peoples at the fair and in his travels, including witnessing other cultures, art and spiritual productions, such as Native American totem poles. Later Ainu artists such as Sunazawa Biki would create Ainu works influenced by such totem poles and other global indigenous cultural productions. All the while, Goro was objectified, poked, prodded, and measured by all sorts of scientists and anthropologists. Indeed, the contact zone was characterized by a diversity of encounters. Goro's body stood in stark contrast to the dominant image of the Ainu that focused on hairy hirsute bodies. I show these print reproductions as just a small sample of the vast visual culture that formed around the Ainu in the United States and Great Britain. Although some scholars, such as James Van Stone, have argued that the Ainu were instructed to grow their beards out to demonstrate their Ainu-ness and cater to the expectations of the stereotype, Madoc Saltzman argues that growing beards may have signified freedom from astringent assimilation policies and a desire to represent this important part of their culture. Either way, bearded or not, I feel that the youthful body of Goro would have stood out among contemporary media representations Ainu men were not only depicted as hairy, but almost always as a patriarch or one of the graybeards that stars tried so desperately to search for in Hokkaido. By not fitting into the stereotype, Goro's likeness would, be sought as, would not be sought as much as his older counterparts. In 2005, with the help of Bete Goro's granddaughter, Chikamori Kiyomi, Miyatake Kimio discovered two Ainu technupe, or embroidered gloves, that may have been produced by Bete Goro at the St. Louis Exposition. Although beyond the confines of this paper, Miyatake's scholarship brings in a new dimension to the study of Bete Goro and the Ainu, their hand-produced objects sold to fairgoers. Whether considered art or craft, the Ainu at the fair were not only explorers in their own right, but also producers of interesting hybrid objects, integrated into the very fabric of the World's Fair. We acknowledge the creative process in this photograph, but we are always witness to the shadowy figures of women in the background and the looming younger man on the edges of the frame. One has to wonder whether or not these modern encounters of the Ainu with the United States are reflected and in the readily ignored Ainu-made objects, such as embroidery, woven mats, and carvings especially when the creation process is so vividly captured in the photographic record. For Bete Goro, participation in the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, although not unproblematic, allowed him to pursue new experiences and to live out a different kind of wanderlust behind the confines of Hokkaido. He interacted with people in Tokyo and St. Louis, sat for photographs, and created unique hybrid objects. And then he took these encounters back with him to Japan. In contrast, Frederick Starr used the World's Fair as a cover for his own personal explorations of Japan in search of objects and art that piqued his intellectual curiosity. For him, it was dabbling in an interesting hybrid of art and scientific collecting. When Frederick Starr revisits Hokkaido in 1909, he runs into Bete Goro just before leaving the island for the last time. He writes in his journal, Quote, by the way, just as we were leaving, Manuel recognized Goro in the road. We had feared we should not see him. He is a catechist for a small Ainu village near Mukawa. He was glad to see us and is doing well. He is already gray. Framed as an aside, the two men were passing ships in the night. Frederick Starr and Bete Goro's encounter with each other was in many ways a curious means to an end for each of them. Starr's comment on the grayness of Goro's hair is interesting in light of the fact that this was the condition of the good Ainu type that Starr searched for five years earlier. To conclude, my consideration of these vibrant encounters is not to dismiss the problems associated with displaying Native peoples. The post-colonial reading of the Native village in the World's Fair, where Aboriginal people were objectified for their difference, remains a salient and important critique. However, my hope is that in examining the strange overlap of anthropology, art collecting, and travel, we can achieve a fuller picture of some of the more peripheral transactions occurring across the Pacific and account for the unexpected appearances of art collection and art production 
in new and interesting contexts, usually located outside the purview of art history. As we visit the exhibition today, to examine the unique hybrid objects produced by Isamu Noguchi and Chipai Shu, I hope that we can also consider the diversity and unevenness that not only characterize this encounter, but other modern exchanges, such as the early 20th century engagement with the Ainu that exists on the fringes of both discipline and nation. Thank you.